Okay, good afternoon. So now is the time where I get to just say a few things and then any of you can come up with some brief closing remarks as well. So I was thinking back to why we decided to have this meeting. We decided to have this meeting in part because there are so many needs for population health and who actually is going to be meeting those needs is a really important and pressing question. And we had a choice. We could have had three meetings, one focused on training for public health and medical professionals, one focused on community health workers, and one focused on other sectors. But we decided to have one meeting. And um, part of the reason to have the meeting was to be able to look across all three because you need all three to come together to actually make progress on a problem. You couldn't really do it with just one alone. And I thought that la I thank everyone for participating in that last exercise, but you got a sense that there's some things you really needed you know, the hospital to understand, but then there's some things you really needed community health workers to do. And so, um, as well as the police and others who are in a community to, to make a difference. So um, I am going to conclude with saying that in each of these three areas, I think this meeting highlighted opportunities and challenges. And uh, for the first panel, which talked about public health and health care, the opportunity is that people are, you know, there are definitely people and their visions that exist around public health 3.0, around more broad views of population health. People have envisioned the idea that people in these fields should be able to be more effective population health leaders. The challenge is that there's still enormous gaps in training that we heard about. And another challenge is there's not a straight line between where the education is right now and how we're going to get to where we're going to go. I thought it was a telling question. How does the uh, accreditation directly impact the training for people to be able to do this work in these fields? And there's not a really compact, solid answer to that question, which means that the field still has a little ways to go to get to um, just even within healthcare and public health. Number two, for community health workers, I thought the opportunity was just the incredible enthusiasm, the evidence that community health workers can make a big difference. I, I, I wrote down on my little pad here, lived experience plus. So you have lived experience plus you have additional training that allows for a different kind of impact that really nobody else can make. But there are challenges, particularly around the fact that um, there's sort of like a ceiling placed on the potential for community health workers by the fact that people don't really know how to use them and may not be incentivized to use them very well. And that limits the training that can happen. I am partial to Maryland since I'm from Maryland, but I, I really thought that Maryland uh, was very interesting because they talked about a big time financial model through the healthcare system to the tune of millions of dollars and hundreds of community health workers where the hospitals themselves are incentivized to improve health. And so I came away, you know, a little more optimistic. I actually hadn't really heard that much about that program until today. But to me, it sort of um, uh, scratched the itch that came up when I heard about how people were having trouble convincing people. Here you had the hospital system paying for and training and really engaging with um, a whole bunch of organizations around community health workers. The third, um, in terms of other sectors, I think you could see the potential interest that other sectors have in getting trained in public health and going further. Um, but there are limitations, um, one of which is a language limitation. People can't really, you know, uh, it, the training may be in one language and people may be focused on their particular job and not realize that it's relevant to them. Also, um, the, you know, when you train someone in another field in public health, what job are you really preparing them for? And the idea that jobs may not really exist for a public health trained planner or a public health trained transportation person, that is a limit to the workforce capacity. So I see opportunities and challenges in all three. And my last thoughts were, well, how do they come together? I I'm going to defend to my dying breath having all three in the same meeting. I know, because I thought it was really interesting to see that. And I think, particularly at the end, that you really can get, I think, momentum 
by you know each one of these strands pulling forward if you can link them particularly around problems. So um, I would say that as each one of these pushes forward, you know, as you get a bigger push within public health education and medical education, like it, nobody gets off the hook for their individual tracks. It, I think it's important for foundations, for government, for others to really invest in the workforce at the juncture between these different tracks. And what could that look like? Carla, uh, who is uh, here somewhere, um, had a very good idea, which is, you know, why, why aren't there more interprofessional conferences? Or maybe interprofessional is not even the right word. You know, conferences that are really focused on these three areas of training. Why aren't there more products that can be used to train community health workers and healthcare so that they know how to work together. You know, there, there are a whole range of things. Everything, you know, is in its own area, but I think that there's enormous value of putting um, uh, resources in at, at the junctures. And I also think that, and partly that's the reason that last exercise was, was uh, structured that way, is that the locomotive that can pull that together is a really strong political priority in improving a major social outcome. And if you can find a place, a leader, where people really, really are committed to reducing absenteeism, reducing homelessness, taking something that really matters, then that should be an opportunity for people to invest in the workforce across all three of these areas. So th those are my thoughts. And before I turn it over, I want to give a special thanks to the people who made this meeting possible. Um, my co-chair, Sani Magnin, a huge thanks to Carla Alvarado. Carla just did an enormous amount of work to pull this off. Um, Alina Bachu, thank you very much. Alina. Kimani Hamilton Ray, thank you very much. Um, and uh, I think that, I hope that it's been informative for people and that they can identify ways that they can both push their own little world forward, but also think about the intersection between these three uh, areas. And so with that, I am now uh, ready. I think we have a someone who um, got the last person before being cut off. You can come all the way up. I'm going to let you come all oh. the way up here. You're going to get this one. That's right. That's, uh, thank you so much. Thank you, Yash. Yeah, twice today I got stuff from asking questions. So now you're going to have to hear my ruminations. Buenas tardes, mi nombre es Lourdes Rodriguez, and I serve as director of the Center for Place-Based Initiatives at the Dell Medical School at the University of Texas in Austin, and I'm a member of the Roundtable. Um, so I, I, I would like to share some things that I learned and some things that I am leaving with questions. Um, one is that if we're, if we're calling for health, health in all policies approach, how do, what's the, what's the um, opposite direction of that applied to our understanding of health, right? Because I'm really big in being bidirectional. So, for example, what can we learn from people who do logistics work to do health better? What can we learn from people who do communications and customer satisfaction so that we can do health better? Um, what can we learn from transportation engineers so we can do our health better, right? So I'm leaving with that as a question. Um, I, I'm, I was thinking about community health workers a lot, and in part because the panel challenged me to think about three things, the science behind community health workers, um, the financing of community health workers. So it's not just about like serial grant funding programs for community health workers. But then uh, I think it was Shreya who used the word ecosystem. So it made me think about not just the training of community health workers, but the ecosystem in which they exist. Um, and then um, I was really um, um, surprised by um, how we didn't get to talk about in the cross-sector panel to talk about cross-sector funding of initiatives, right? Because if we're training people to play well together, they need to share. <laughs> in kindergarten, you learn that you have to share your candies with other ones, right? So if we're bringing people to work together in, across sectors, how can we then um, pro, uh, support cross-budgeting, uh, cross-financing of projects 
Um, and so I guess applying the categorical program bias to the pay and paying for things. So those are my reflections. Thank you. Yes, but we're recording. So everybody who's watching, remember. Except you won't see me, I'm so short. Sure. Well, do you want to go to one of those? <laughs> oh, okay. I would like to present what I would consider a lost opportunity for this group to consider. And that is, is a, an immediate problem that I'm having. I am feel, finding out that the new arrivals from countries like Vietnam, Southeast Asia, South Asia even, they feel, because they saw so many health issues in the country, immediately they want to go into the medical profession, specifically to be doctors. Myself, I haven't, except for a few classmates at my doctoral program at Michigan, I never knew about mental health professionals. But these people, I, one of them that I'm now counseling, who is in high school, I try to tell her that you first go to a, say, liberal arts college. I went to Mount Holyoke. One of my classmates became a very good doctor. They would hear nothing about it. Immediately, they want to go to a medical school. Just think of the lost opportunity that we could involve these very bright, willing, hardworking students into the profession of public health. Thank you for listening. Some of us made it through medical school and got to public health, but you know, it's not the only path. Um, okay, who else? Comments? Come, up, come on up here. Uh, I'm trying to use this mic. Does it work still? Come on up to the front. Come on up to the front. <laughs> and then... Hi, everyone. I'm Kathy Bozzi, the uh, board chair for the Michigan Health Improvement Alliance, and I sit on the round table as well. Um, just a, a, a lot of thanks for the meeting, and I really appreciated all the speakers and the panels. Just really well done. Rich conversation. Um, a piece of this story, especially with these breakout sessions that were going on and how we're going to convene people and how we're going to get pe the money to pay for this and all of this, um, a piece of the story isn't necessarily the story of the workforce, but it's the enabling framework for the partnerships that we've been talking about. And so I just wanted to bring back up for making sure it's on the record and on people's minds, the construct of multi-stakeholder collaboratives, the sort of uh, backbone or integrator organizations, something that we have focused on in the course of this roundtable as an important enabling framework at the community level and just how valuable they can be if you happen to have one of those. And oftentimes the way they're managed is they are jointly funded by all stakeholders, they, their operations. They aren't huge, um, but it's a, it's a vehicle that brings together public health and business and healthcare and the nonprofit community and community-based organizations and all of those things. So I just wanted to remind us maybe of these backbone or integrator organizations and their uh, valuable contribution in being uh, supportive of getting us together. Can I ask you a question before on that point? Sure. I'm going to put you on the spot. So for those organizations, which I know you know an awful lot about, how well do you feel that there are there's training available for them? Or do they need, you know, I mean, does everyone sort of has to start and find their way? Is there anything that could be provided? If, as we think about workforce, is there something that would be useful? Because, you know, that is sort of the integration of the three groups in practice. What could be done to strengthen that from a workforce training capacity? Um, excellent question. And I don't think there's a perfect answer. I don't know of, of specific credentialing that anybody goes through to coordinate one of these multi-stakeholder collaboratives. I think people come from a variety of different backgrounds and that the leadership in those communities, if you look at the pulse check report that 
that Rethink put out that, or others that the um, stimulation of the creation of one of those sometimes comes from various sectors. It can come from anybody, but I don't know that there is a defined training around doing that. I think it could be helpful um, and, and uh, having some core resources around that, just like we were talking about for community health workers, but there's not sort of specific credentialing for um, multi-stakeholder collaboratives. <laughs> Um, but the, the point is about getting people together. And, and they do also um, oftentimes, and I wouldn't say always, uh, include an aspect of resident engagement in that process of, of the voices and giving agency to all stakeholders, including the citizens. So I'm going to blame Carla because she's the one who said I should say this to the whole group. So I'll say it to the whole group. Um, so first of all, I just want to thank the organizers again. Um, this has been a great day. But I think just a couple of things that came up for us, um, especially out of that last activity, were that, first of all, if you really want to fully integrate community health workers into population health work, then at least two things are going to be really crucial. And one is recognize community health workers as a discrete and uniquely important group of health professionals. So if you're talking about the state community health worker organization, you're talking about it just as you're talking about the state medical association or the state nursing association. It's a specific thing. It's not just a CBO. It's a community health worker organization. And secondly, if you really want to, um, and Steve, speaking even in healthcare terms, if you want the true value added from the community health worker model, then you really have to think of community health workers not just as individuals who connect other individuals to existing health services, but you have to really look at the history of this profession and its roots in political and social justice organizing. and. Part of that is, so maybe some of the training that you need in order to adequately address a housing crisis in a community is more community organizing training for community health workers so that they can fully play that role. Because if they aren't supported and enabled to play that role, it's going to be much harder for them. So those are just two things I wanted to share. Thank you. Before Gary comes, stay here, stay here, stay here, stay here. I just want to thank the, the three panel leaders, Phyllis Meadows, Karen Murphy, and Gary Gunderson. Each of them did at least 12 to 15 prep calls um, and, uh, but, and managed to survive and do a great job. Gary. Thank you, Josh. My first word is uh, thank you, Josh, for insisting on the trilogy. It was very awkward. Uh, to hold that together, but it was so worth it. So thank you for that. Uh, I don't want to go another second without thanking uh, Carla and Alina for, for doing magical work in uh, pulling this together. Um, this was the workshop I thought wasn't going to work, uh, but it did, and it was largely largely because of the extraordinary work that, that you all did. Um, my one comment about this is to... Uh, suggest we, we move away from um, thinking that training is the most important thing and move towards the assumption of creating in every single person of influence, I'm trying to avoid the word leader or professional, uh, every grown-up, uh, the expectation that, that there's enough expertise in any community to do what's necessary at least the next five or six right things. And the tenacity of leadership is the same, is, is linked right with the creativity necessary to, to figure it out. But every community has what's necessary to do the next right thing. And that'll open up the next right thing beyond that. And so there's something about gathering here at this extraordinary place where there are posters of Einstein everywhere uh, to think that we have to be that smart in order to figure it out. But what we really need is the character of humility and curiosity to, to lend our 
to lend ourselves to that work that's necessary. And I think if we sort of raise that up as a professional expectation, um, we're more likely to find the humility necessary to to figure all this stuff out. So thank you to the Extraordinary Witness, especially the Community Health Worker Panel, uh, for sort of em embodying the very virtues that we, that we say we need. Thanks. Thank you to, uh, to the leadership from Sandy and Josh for the work of the roundtable. I'm Terry Allen. I uh, work at the Cuyahoga County Health Department in Greater Cleveland, a member of the roundtable, and also to Kamani in the back, who is a fellow Cavs fan in thick and, through thick and thin. Thank you, Kamani. He's also a big part of this work. So for me, uh, there was a slide in the morning uh, that uh, showed the spectrum of community integrated care that I thought was interesting around food security. You may recall it, it had uh, from the patient population to the community and then from um, upstream to downstream and it had a range of interactions uh, to address food security. It could be related to cooking classes, it could be related to food pantries and hospital systems or, or uh, act, uh, grocery store, um, momentum around grocery stores and, and food deserts. And for me, that integration uh, was a validation of the integration of the panels today because of the necessary range of expertise that uh, may be required to pull off that work and that all that work is important for different reasons. And so uh, I thought listening to Kevin Barnett this morning talk about the work in California, that's a model I think, not that we have to repeat, we can, we can pull information from that very rich data to, to think about those very issues in, in states across across the country. So I thought that was very powerful. Uh, personally, the conversations that we heard from the community health workers, for me, and the longer I've been in, in, involved in public health and, and work around equity, diversity, and inclusion, it was very powerful even into lunchtime to spend some time to hear from the community health workers and listen to the Herculean work that they do beyond the normal workday and the connections that they have to very very uh, personal level with the people that they take care of. It's very humbling uh, to listen to those relationships and what they do. And I think we all would do well in, in the other sectors to listen and spend time listening to them about how we can better care uh, for folks in the different ways that we do. Uh, lastly, um, I know that this is, and uh, talking with Lena, I know that this is my last meeting. As a member of the roundtable, I'm cycling off. I've uh, finished my term and I wanted to just say, this has been a great pleasure to be part of all this work and to meet the roundtable members and to work with all of you who are um, brothers and sisters together in this effort to really uh, think about what we do differently to help all the people that we care about so much. So thank you. Hi, I'm Han Kyo Yu with the California Endowment. Um, one of the most interesting um, presentation was actually Noelle when she mentioned um, introducing popular education by FERA as part of the training component for community health workers. And I thought, as we're opening up and thinking about curricula for public health, why not put popular education in there? Stop. And yeah, I would have loved to have heard more. <laughs> yeah, because uh, we really focus on power building as our work and looking at the most marginalized, those most impacted. And if we want people to think about what Kevin was saying earlier about building a pipeline and trying to really make sure that taking care of our own, making sure that we come back to our communities and really build up from out there. And of course, there's all of the needs around professionalization and accreditation of that, but just thinking about the rootedness of this work and how it's about community and well-being of community and bringing that aspect in there, I thought that was just wonderful. So how do we think about really bringing all of that in? Sandy Macknan, and I also want to echo all the thanks, but want to include one additional person who's not here today, but was previously on the round table, George Flores. And he was the person who actually, from the California Endowment, 
kept bringing this topic of workforce uh, back to the table and saying that we needed to do more and we needed to consider a workshop on that. So, George, wherever you are in retirement, <laughs> I hope you're having a great time and I hope you'll listen to this because we send you a great big thanks uh, for your leadership in getting us to this workshop uh, today. I just wanted to comment on a couple of things in each of those sections that really stood out to me. I think Phyllis asked that question uh, in her panel about are, are we targeting the right people for what we need to accomplish next? And how are we keeping equity uh, at the forefront of what we're trying to accomplish? And I think that's just something we need to just continually come back to uh, that question. And particularly as we think about this pipeline and we heard those statistics from California about what's happening and um, we just need to keep those things uh, in our minds and in our action plans. And then when we uh, talked about the community, uh, I loved what uh, Shreya said about are we, you know, training for firefighters or are we training to put out fires? And we talked in our little group uh, about that and said, you know, it's probably a both and. Uh, we probably got to be doing both, but we need to always be thinking about what are we trying to accomplish here, and we do need to be putting out those fires, uh, because otherwise the firefighters are just going to get overwhelmed, and we won't have really trained them for what we need to be accomplishing by not letting the fires start in, in the first place. Um, the part about our, our non-health uh, uh, sectors, I love the fact that it was, I believe it was Fairfax, uh, that the person who was from public health was actually embedded in a zoning and community development office. Why aren't we doing more of that? Why? I, it sounded like there were a lot of barriers to overcome, but we should just be thinking about how do you spread that as a best practice? of how are we going to create these relationships and, and learn the language of other sectors versus forcing, and I even get worried about health and all policies or you know health and all, it's, it has an arrogance about it. I think we need to think about how do we speak their language, not what we want to have said, but how we speak their language that we know will actually accomplish better health uh, for all. And then the last thing, um, in, in thinking about what Kevin said at the very beginning, and I reflect on this as he put his options around how to train different health care workers with nurse practitioners being primary care and being psychiatrists and community health workers and, and an array of different types of, of workers that in Minnesota, when we tried to incorporate dental therapists into the new workforce, um, there are a lot of, there's a lot of resistance for change. We all talk about we want transformation, but transformation means change, which means we need to change. <laughs> and change is really hard. It's that Dilbert cartoon, you know, uh, I like change, you go first. Um, and that we really need to think about how do we help people get to that place where they can accept a dental therapist. Uh, and the world in Minnesota has not come to an end since dental therapists have been there, I think, about six years. <laughs> There's maybe less than 100 of them. There's still many other types of dental professions but they are serving a unique need, particularly in lower socioeconomic populations who did not have access to dental care. What about those nurse practitioners that could be working in psychiatry for people who are not able to access, we saw what the need was, not able to access the mental health um, professionals that we need. We need to find a way to, to help people in other professions be able to accept these changes. And I think that's something we could think about. How do we actually equip people to accept new things that in one sense can seem threatening to them, and yet on another sense would actually open up possibilities for what we could accomplish. Um, the la last thing, and I think that as we have these workshops, 
we are changing the language. One of the things that came up in our small group about a strategy that needed to be accomplished was to create a common language that people would talk about food security. How would we even talk about it? What's the common language we can use for thinking about different issues? I think one of the things the Roundtable is able to accomplish as this trusted venue is creating some common language around how we're going to describe some of these problems. And that, I think, can be long-lasting and can lay a foundation for how we build trust and relationships. So thank you to everyone who came today and participated. And I'm going to turn it back over to Josh. Josh, can I, one, just a sort of a. Martha Gold here, an addendum perhaps to Sani, who we've talked a lot about language and communication over the years. And I've been particularly resistant to the health framing of everything, particularly as to who we want as partners. And so just a, a, a question for people to ponder. Uh, I missed too much of the panel on community health workers, but I'm wondering whether there's um, a reason to think of them as community workers rather than community health workers, and whether if we were to think that way, we would be in a, a situation where we could go out and get funding from other kinds of people who are interested in transforming the quality of life in communities. A community well-being. Yes, that's absolutely true. And, and as Terry said, uh, this is my last meeting. I've been on the panel for two terms, and that's it. And I'm certainly going to miss um, these wonderful conversations. Uh, I've learned a great deal here, and I'm very thankful to the staff and to my colleagues who have enriched me to no end. I just want to say thank you uh, for doing this and for giving us the space um, to to be here. Um, I think this is the beginning of continuing that collaboration and all of that. Um, and just very briefly, in regards to the question you said, if we could call them community workers, we actually have different ways. It, it, that's the definition that we all came about nationally because we use different names. We use promotores de salud, um, community health workers, um, outreach workers, um, CHRs. CHRs that are in the Indian health um, services. So because we have all these names that we identify with in the community, we didn't want to take that away from each other. Therefore. Nationally, we came to an agreement, okay, that's in general the, the name that we're all going to encompass, but we do, do go by other names. <laughs> so thank you all. Thank you. Okay. I got the high sign from Carla. Um, thank you all very much for coming today, and I hope that... Um, you share this. This has all been recorded with other people in your networks. And we will be in touch with other opportunities to continue to push this um, work forward. Thank you. <laughs>